All right, well, thank you for coming. So two reasons I love being here. Number one, I'm from Idaho, so sunny California. It's very nice. Um, and number two, I have four kiddos. My oldest is six. So I have a six-year-old, a four-year-old, a two-year-old, and a six-month-old. This is a vacation. <laughs> so my husband's not having much fun, though. I've got to tell you that. So um, like I said, I, I, my job right now is I get to be a, a math specialist. I go around and, and help out teachers in the classroom. Um, I am a former middle school teacher, and I am a, a recovering traditionalist. Uh, I was. I learned traditional procedures. I was very good at procedures in mathematics. I was a good memorizer. Thus, I thought I was good at mathematics. Uh, it didn't become clear to me until I became a teacher of mathematics how much I did not understand about math. So I was the t type of teacher who I was, here's how you do it, follow what I do. If you don't understand that, I just repeat it and I repeat it louder. Right? I say that I'm recovering because sometimes I still fall back into that zone of just this is how you do it. Um, because I realized that my understanding just wasn't quite there. I really didn't understand it. So it wasn't until I went back and got my master's degree that I learned there's a different way to think about mathematics. So one of the things I'm going to focus on in here is what are those different ways to think about addition facts? Because I was a memorizer. It was 8 plus 7 is 15. It just is. right? Um, the trouble we have is that a lot of kids aren't very good at memorizing and they don't have any backup strategies, um, especially at the middle school. I still saw a lot of kids, their backup strategy was counting on their fingers. Okay? So what does it take to get kids past that? That's what we're going to look at and we're going to use a couple of tools to help us with that. So my favorite tools out there, there's three of them. I love the one that, that's kind of out there for some of you. Um, it's called a wreck and wreck. That's the word that comes from the Netherlands. That's what it's called over there. Um, the tool you guys have, that some of you have, um, they're kind of spaced throughout, and I'm sorry, I don't have any more. Um, but we're going to be sharing the, through the presentation. And those of you who have one sitting there, you actually get to take those with you. So um, keep a hold of it if you've got one there with you, right? <laughs> um, so the one that you have there, um, a guy in Chicago makes these, and he calls them the math rack. I used to make my own with popsicle sticks and hot glue guns and pony beads and all that kind of stuff. And like I said, now I have four kids. I don't have time to make them. Uh, plus, he, he is very gracious and lets me give them away to you guys and let you use them here. So I don't have to make them for you. Um, so the, the math rack actually comes from the Netherlands. It's called a wreck and wreck. Uh, it's also known as um, an, an addition frame, a thinking frame, a, a number rack. There's lots of variations on the term. Uh, arithmetic rack, the, the original term is called a wreck and wreck. Uh, the other one we're going to talk about is a 10 frame, right? The, those have become quite popular in schools now. So basically, a 10 frame and then the math rack are the same thing. The math rack is a double 10 frame, just all in one tool, which is why I brought that instead of bringing a bunch of 10 frames for you to play around with, because I didn't want to pack all that. Okay? So any activity we do today with that math rack, you can do with 10 frames. If you are currently using 10 frames in your classroom, anything you're doing with 10 frames, you can do the same exact lesson with a math rack. Okay? They are the same tool, just a different format of it. Okay? And we'll talk more about it as we go through. The third one we're going to talk about is a number path um, instead of a number line. If you teach early kiddos, we should be using a number path instead of a number line. One of the first versions of Common Core that came out actually said we should not be using number lines until second grade. They are inappropriate before second grade. Okay? Because number lines are a space version of a number. Okay? So let me show this really quickly. I'll bring up an example here. And I, I really hate like standing up there, but I'm going to, because I like to move around a lot. So we'll see how this goes. Okay? So if I'm using a number line, right, we have kiddos doing this. We've got 0, 1, 2, 3. Where exactly is 3 for little kids? Right? The only reason they will get to a three is because they see the number three. They really aren't seeing three things because where three is, there's actually four things. 
right? So, so a number line is not a quantity version of a number, it's a space version because three is three spaces. It's three distances, one, two, three. It's not three things that kids can physically see, okay? So a number path helps kids see that three is three things, that when I circle out to three, it helps me see where th what three looks like, three actual things. So number, the number paths, of course it's gonna freeze up on me here. So a number path, um, on my website, and the, the website was at the beginning again. Um, let's see if this is, okay, yes. Okay. Sometimes, I love technology and sometimes I hate it, right? Okay. So I'm trying to present off my iPad so I can walk around and not be tied here, all right? Okay, so the number path, I have these for free on my website. I also have um, 10 frame cards and all this stuff at mathematicallyminded.com. You can download them. Um, a lot of people will take the number path instead of a number line on your um, kids' desks. Just print these off and then take the big packing tape and stick over it and then the kids can write on it with whiteboard markers and wipe it right off. Okay, so you can print your own and then put them on your kids' um, tables or their desks. Okay, all right, so let's get going. What actually is fluency? How do we know that a kid is fluent, right? Um, it isn't a time test. I'll tell you that right now. It isn't a time test. Time test is a way to measure it, but there's so much more that goes into developing fluency that if all we do when it comes to facts is doing mad minutes or whatever timed thing that you do, it's not enough, right? Every once in a while we do need to assess how fluent or how fast they are and how many they're getting right, but we have to do some instruction in the meantime. So think about something in your own life, not in, not in academics per se, um, that you are fluent at. Okay. Just in your personal life, what's something you feel like you're fluent at? Okay. Anybody got something that comes up off the top of their head? Talking. Talking. <laughs> Driving a car. Driving a car. Cooking. Cooking. Tying your shoe. Anybody fluent in another language? Okay. So now the question is, what makes you feel like you are fluent? How? Because I am not fluent at cooking. I can tell you that right now. I am not fluent at cooking. Okay. I can do it. I can follow the steps of the recipe, right? Just like the steps of an algorithm. But I don't feel fluent at it even though I can follow a recipe. I am not a fluent cook or chef, right? To be fully fluent, you do have to be accurate. You have to be able to follow the steps, get to the end product, right? Whatever it might be. If you're speaking another language, I know a little bit of French. I could say a French word while I'm pointing at the chair, right? But I may not be accurate. I might not be using the right word for it. So accuracy matters. We do need to be correct. The biggest piece that most of us are missing when it comes to feeling like we're fluent at something or we're not, is that we aren't flexible. I am not flexible when cooking. If I don't have a, a needed ingredient in there, I can't make that recipe. I don't know what to substitute in. I don't know how to just throw stuff into a pot and make it, you know, I can't do that stuff, right? I have to follow step by step by step or I can't get there. That is unfortunately where too many of our kiddos are. They have to follow something step by step by step. They don't have flexibility to be able to find an alternate route to get there. Okay. And then the last piece is they have to be efficient. So I might be accurate, I might have some flexibility, but sometimes I might not be efficient when I'm doing something. So, you know, if you're, I'm taking an example of, you know, flying in here and I take the taxi cab person, right? They might get me to the right spot. They might have some flexibility, right? Of which route they're gonna go, but you know, I want them to be efficient. I want them to take the shortest route possible to get me where I'm going so it costs me the least amount. Right? So we need them, we need to be, have all three to feel like we are fluent at something. And that's what we need kids to have, is we need them, the biggest part that's missing is that flexibility. Kids can get an answer, 
they'll get it somewhat fast, some of them, but then the finger counting stuff starts in, okay? Um, oh, just a, a really quick thing. This, we only have an hour, so sometimes I'm gonna go pretty fast. Feel free to take pictures of anything that's up there, but these, this is all in the handouts also. If you've been on the Title I conference website, this, everything, almost everything, I, I took out a few slides because I didn't want you to see what was coming if you have the slides in front of you, okay? So, so most everything is on there, and if you haven't downloaded, you can go download them that afterwards also, okay? Okay, so the three reasons that we're gonna talk about why most kids don't end up being fluent, we're gonna address each one of these. Number one is that we have an over-reliance on counting. Too many kids count one by one by one, okay? The other piece is that they lack number sense. That's one of the reasons why they can't get past counting one by one by one. They lack the number sense needed. And then the last one is that the manipulatives we use make a huge difference. That's why I'm talking, we're gonna be talking about the three things there, the, the math rack, the 10 frames, and a number path. Because those three things, if you're using them in the classroom, make a world of difference based upon just using like linking cubes or you know the individual teddy bear counters or whatever we're using in the classroom, okay? All right. So really quickly, this research comes from Cognitively Guided Instruction, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, Cognitively Guided Instruction did, looked at how kids solve, what strategies they have for solving addition and also subtraction. Basically, the stuff at the top is kids start out with directly modeling exactly what the problem says. So if the problem is three plus four, they have to count out three, they have to count out four, and then they go back and do what? Count everything. Right? Kiddos who are in that direct modeling stage are really, really accurate. They are almost always right because they, they count, they recount everything. The part that they're missing is they aren't flexible and they are not efficient. It takes forever for kids to get through that, okay? Once kids get to that point, then we start encouraging them to well, hold one of those numbers in your head. So then you only have to count like a third of how much you're doing. Right, so if I'm doing three plus four, we encourage them to hold the four in your head and then count on three, right? Okay, this is the part where kiddos get stuck. That counting on sticks with them forever, right? We even have adults who still use their fingers, right? For addition stuff. So where we, where we would like to get them is to just know their fact, right? And that's where we tend to go. Okay, once you're able to count on, now just memorize it. Three plus four is seven, three plus four is seven, three plus four is seven, just know it, do it, memorize it, okay? But what happens if they don't remember it? What's their fallback strategy? Going back to this, they don't have a backup plan, okay? So, so the, the stage down there at the bottom is what they call derived facts. There are certain facts that we tend to gravitate towards and that we know instantly more than others. So if I'm doing three plus four, instead of just knowing three plus four, I might know three plus three, and then I can add one more. That's the, an, an example of a drive fact, right? So the hard part is though, our textbooks spend about one lesson on that. You have a lesson on doubles, maybe a lesson on doubles plus one, and then the kids are just supposed to know how to do it and use it, right? The part that they're lacking is all the number sense it actually takes to be able to do that, plus they just trust the counting thing. Right? The first way that we learn to do something sticks with us forever, no matter what it is. Right? There's a research study done on um, professional bicyclists that when they're about to get into a wreck, they actually start pedaling backwards. Right? If you ride a, an adult bicycle, what does pedaling backwards do? Nothing. What did it do when you first learned to ride a bike? It was your brakes. So even though they're professionals, they do it all the time, Right? When you are in trouble, you revert back to the way you first learned it. We spend too much time teaching kids to count and to be able to count one by one by one, right? The only problems we should allow kids to count on is if you're adding three or less. If a kid is doing eight plus seven, they should not be counting on to solve that problem. If I'm doing eight plus two, Okay, it's all right, eight, nine, 10, I can do that pretty quick. But if I'm doing eight plus seven, we should not be letting them do that, right? But how do we get them there? What, what's the alternative, okay? That's what we're gonna talk about. So 
if, if you don't, aren't familiar with cognitively, um, cognitively guided instruction and instead have been trained in math recovery, if you know anything about math recovery, um, these are the same things, just different names because they're by different researchers. So to publish their stuff, they have to put different names on them. Okay? So these are, these are basically the same thing. Direct modeling is the same thing as a perceptual and figurative, figurative counter. The counting, math recovery calls it counting on. Derived facts, math recovery calls it a non-count by one strategy. Okay? They're the same things, just different names. All right, so let's talk about how we learn. Okay? You're going to have three seconds. It's going to be up there for three seconds. I want you to try to memorize this 10-digit number. So you cannot write anything down. So if you guys need to, stand up so you can see the screen. If, and I'll try to get out of the way here. Okay? It's only going to be there for three seconds, and then it's going to go away. As soon as it goes away, write down all the numbers you remember. Okay? Here it comes. Okay, write down what you remember. Anybody think they have all 10 digits in those three seconds? You think you might? Might. might. Think so? Might. Okay, now this time it's going to appear again for a short time, and then it's going to disappear. When it comes up this time, it's going to look slightly different. I've made a little bit change it a little bit to help you out, maybe. And I want you to try to look for a connection between the numbers that are up there. Look for a connection. You ready? Okay, here it comes. Now try to write them down. Did you have it? The first time? Did you have it the first time? Now how many of you think you got it? Okay. For those of, of us that didn't get it through those, what was the connection that you saw? What did you see? Plus four. So if I tell you the connection is plus four, what do you really have to only know? First number. I need to know it started with three. I know the connection. That helps me figure out all of it. Right? This, is, this is how our brain works. This is how we learn. Some of us are just good at memorizing. Not many, though. Not many of us are, I mean, I'm doing this really quickly in three seconds. So, you know, if I gave you more time, most of us would be a little better at that. But I'm doing it fast on purpose. Some of our kids are good memorizers, and they will be good memorizers, and they can memorize and learn their facts. Other kids will see connections without us explicitly teaching it. They will see how 3 plus 3 helps me know what 3 plus 4 is without me saying a word. Right? Other kids need that connection explicitly brought out to them because it is not obvious to them how 3 plus 3 is connected to 3 plus 4. Those are completely different problems to a lot of kiddos. Okay? Which makes it then, this is our addition chart, just addition. 0 through 10 plus 0 through 10, that is 121 different facts to memorize. 121 facts, just for addition. Then you throw subtraction on top of that, multiplication on top of that later, and division on top of that later. Because for our struggling kiddos, the addition and subtraction are not connected. Right? That, that's a whole other side issue. So one of the big things, just so you know, I don't talk about subtraction because if we spend enough time on addition, making sure addition is solid, Subtraction is the byproduct of that. Because really, when I see 15 minus 7, I'm not thinking, what is 15 minus 7? I'm thinking, oh, I know 8 plus 7 makes 15. And I get my answer. Right? So if we make addition solid, subtraction comes nicely from it. Okay? We just have some other things we need to look at. All right, so what, ha what would we love for kids to do? Instead of counting on fingers, if they couldn't remember 7 plus 8, what would you love to hear them say? Right. Tell, turn right close to your neighbors real quick. Tell them one thing you would love to hear them say. Okay, so 
let's come back together real quick. Hopefully you heard a few of these up there. A lot of times the doubles come out when we're talking about seven plus seven, whether it's a double plus one or a double minus one. Just depends which one is nice for you, right? The make a 10 strategy of seven plus three or eight plus two. And then the bottom one is a really interesting strategy that is coming out the more and more people use 10 frames and math racks. Because kids, I, li I, I like to call this the finding the fives, right? When you put seven into a 10 frame, and you put eight into a 10 frame, kids see the seven as a five and two extra. Kids see the eight as a five and three extra. And they know that five and five make a 10. So kids have naturally picked these strategies up. Here's the thing about these strategies. We should not have to teach them directly. We shouldn't, right? These come when kids have number sense. When kids have number sense, these naturally occur in children. Right? The key is we need to spend a whole lot more time than our textbooks give us on developing number sense and helping kids see connections. Those are the parts that are not in our textbooks that we need to bring in there. Okay? So this is a chart. This, again, is, it's in your handouts. I also run a, a website called factfluency.com, and this chart is on there. And all the videos that we're going to watch are on this website as well. Okay. I, I believe instead of teaching individual facts, let's learn our plus ones, let's learn our plus twos, our plus threes, that there are only four types of facts we need to have kids work on. And these are the th ones that come kind of nicely for kiddos. Okay. The orange diagonal there are our doubles. Two plus two, pl three plus three, four plus four. Um, John Vandewall's work, if you have not got that book, I'll have the reference at the end. It is, should be, it is mine, um, your mathematical Bible for teaching mathematics. I'll have the reference at the end, but it's amazing. I have learned so much from that book, and it's only like a $30 book. It's the best book out there. It's by John Vandewall. I'll have the reference at the end. It's called Teaching Student-Centered Mathematics. But, okay, so he talks about... In, when we're doing doubles, we don't need kids to just memorize them. You, there's lots of activities we can do to help with that. Okay? Um, and we don't have enough time to go through all of that in here. But one of his common suggestions is creating posters around your room that show doubles in real life. Right? We, the doubles appear everywhere. What's this one? Five and five make ten. Guess what a spider is? Four legs on one side, four on the other make Eight, right? In Idaho, we love a four-wheeler. Why is it called a four-wheeler? Two wheels in the front, two wheels in the back, right? So, so helping kids make connections to them. The two that were difficult for me to find, because in John Vandal's book, he doesn't give all of them. The two that were difficult for me to find was, where do I know seven and seven? Where does seven and seven happen a lot? And I posed this to a group of teachers I was working with, and a superintendent popped up and said, that's football scores. Right? Super Bowl just happened, right? Seven points, seven points, we see the score of 14. Elementary teachers tell me all the time it's the calendar, right? Okay, two weeks, one week is seven, another week seven, that gives us 14 days. The other hard one was, for me was eight. The example I've seen a lot out on the internet is crayons, a box of crayons. The original box of crayons was 16. They're hard to find nowadays, I'll tell you that, a box of 16. But a kid, I pose this to a group of second graders, and this group plays chess a lot every Friday. They play chess. I don't play chess, so this one is hard for me to remember, actually. Um, but I believe it's the pawns. Am I getting this right? Do anybody in here play chess? There's eight pawns. You have eight pawns. Your opponent has eight pawns. So in a set, there are 16 pawns in chess. Right? And so for that classroom, that was the way that they remembered eight and eight made 16, because they could visualize those. Right? So just find ways that connect with your kiddos to help them build what doubles are. Have them think about it, make a, a book of the doubles, build anchor charts, put them on your wall, all that kind of stuff of doubles. Okay? Now the lighter orange ones are plus or minus one or two. So if I know four plus four, that should help me with four plus three, because right? it's just one less. So if, if we focus on those doubles, then the lighter orange ones come with it as kids develop number sense and how things relate to each other, how numbers relate to each other. 
Okay, the green diagonal is another common one that kids gravitate towards very quickly. Those are facts that make 10, okay? The reason this becomes nice for kids is because we have it right here, right? Doing, there's a lot of stuff out there about subitizing. Subitizing is being able to instantly tell how many, right? If you hold this up, how many kiddos do you know who still have to count this? They do not have subitizing. They can't instantly tell it, right? But the more that we do these things where we're flashing fingers at them, right? Any time that I have seven up, how many are down? Three. So we got to talk about how many are up and how many are down. If I hold nine up, I know this is nine, not because I count nine, but because it is one down, right? So building all of those facts that make 10. That's why a 10 frame is so powerful and your math rack is so powerful because on each row of your math rack, how many beads are on there? Okay. If you guys don't have one in front of you, hopefully there's one next to you. There's also one hanging up there on the door. The big teacher demo one is magnetic. So it hangs on anything that is um, magnetic, it is steel, okay? So there, there's an example up there, we'll use that as we go through. I'll bring it up in the, in the front for us, but that's the big one. So each row has 10, right? So if I push over six beads, there's gonna be four left on the other side. So kids will get to see those relationships just in the tools that we use, okay? All right, so then again, the lighter green ones are plus or minus one or two. Now, the purple ones are the plus zeros, right? We tend to think plus zeros should be easy, but for some reason that is a little difficult for kiddos to understand, hey, you're adding something, but nothing changes. That, that's weird, right? So, so that is something you need to focus on. Plus zeros should be its own separate thing that we're ch chatting about, okay? And then the blue ones are the 10 plus something. That's what I call them, the 10 plus somethings. Now, most addition charts leave that column and that row off. Most people think of basic facts, and even Common Core does it. They say facts with sums up to 18. That means the biggest one is a plus nine. If we don't focus on plus 10, it messes kids up, right? Because let's think back to the strategies you guys talked about. If we want kids to make a 10, so if I'm doing seven plus eight, I make a 10, now I've got 10 plus five, what happens with a lot of kiddos? They go back to counting on their fingers. They don't know what 10 plus five is. So what was the point in making 10 if I don't know what 10 plus something is, right? So your, your 10 plus somethings have to be something that you really pay attention to with, with kiddos. Basically, those are your teen numbers. And, and our, our language puts our students um, behind just from the start, right? Our word for after 10, right, is not helpful. If we think about our counting, when you're at 20, what comes next? 21, 22, 23, 24, right? We get to see it as a 20 and 3, 20 and 4. Same thing happens when you get in the 30s. You have 30 and 1, 30 and 2. But after the 10, we don't get a 10 and 1, we get 11. Okay, right? In, in a lot of other languages, their word for 11 is their word for 10 and their word for one. That helps their kids understand what that number really means. Our word gives kids no understanding whatsoever and doesn't even follow a pattern. Our teens are just messed up, right? Even, even when you get to ones like 13 and 14, right? So let's talk about 14. At least it has the word four, but now it's got a teen and they're in backwards order. So the four comes first, so the kids want to write the four and then put the one. Oh my goodness, right? So, but then even, let's talk about 13 and 15. It doesn't even have the three and the five. It's a third and a fifth. And we really don't want third graders knowing about a fifth, right, yet. So as we go through, we, we have to really pay attention to those teen numbers, okay? Because it is an important piece that if they don't understand those, they aren't gonna be able to use those strategies we're wanting them to use. And if they can't use those strategies quickly, they're just gonna revert back to this, okay? Because they know this will get them the right answer and they, can, they get fast at it, right? They can get pretty fast at it, but not as fast as strategies can be. Okay, so let's watch some kiddos using some of this, okay? All right, so when we watch this, any of the kids that you see with the blue table in front of them are third graders. The other kiddos are second and first graders, and I don't remember which is which because they were in the same 
um, hallway and same table. So these guys, are, this one's third graders. If you see other kids not at a blue table, they're either first or second. Okay, here we go. So what's four plus? Okay, helps if I actually turn up the volume. Okay. Okay, what about four plus five? Nine. How do you know that? Because five plus five is ten and minus one is nine. Can you show me that again with your fingers? Five plus five is ten and minus one is nine. Is nine. Okay. So what's four plus five? Six plus seven is thirteen. How'd you do that? It's just one more than twelve mm -hmm. from six plus six. Seven plus eight. Mm -hmm. Fifteen. How'd you do that one? Easy. I just know what seven plus seven is. Add one more. Six plus seven. Six plus seven. Thirteen. How'd you do that one? Um, I know that seven plus seven is fourteen, and I just took one away. Nice try. Six plus seven. Fourteen. How'd you do that? Well, because six plus six is twelve, and seven plus seven is 14, so it has to be 13. It has to be 13. So those are some good examples of, of kids who are doing, and what's really cool is I did not tell them how to solve it. I was just giving problems and saying, how do you think about this? And this is what came up. So I gave some problems that I thought would be really easy for kids and they would just instantly know it. And it always surprises me how sometimes they don't just know it and sometimes they have some strategies for figuring out something that I thought they would just know, okay? So we're gonna watch again in these videos what happens. We're gonna do um, some, some kiddos who are doing the 10 plus something, some kids who don't understand that concept and some who do. And then we'll also see a couple kids who are using the, the finding fives strategy, okay? 10 plus six. Just go 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. It'll be 16. It's 10 plus 6. 16. How do you know that? Easy. It's 10. And you pop off that 0 and put a 6 in the 0. 10 plus 6. 16. 16. How do you know that? Because 10. Ten is ten's column and six is one's column. And what's ten plus six? Sixteen. And how do you know that? Because ten, tens, the tens place is ten and then plus six more is the one place, so it's sixteen. Okay. About ten plus six. Sixteen, because um, the ten plus any one digit number is that one and the 10 and the one digit number behind it. Mm -hmm. So before we watch the Finding Fives thing, as you can see in that, it doesn't matter the grade level because at the beginning there was a third grader still counting on her fingers to do 10 plus six. It comes from the number sense that kid has and that comes from their experiences with number. 
you'll see kindergartners who understand what 10 plus 6 is, but kids at third grade who don't. Okay? So it all boils down to the experiences they've had with number and their ability to connect those symbolic pieces that we're asking them to do to the physical things that we have them work on are manipulatives. Okay? All right, our last one here. Oh, sorry, we got two more. Sorry. What's seven plus eight? That's 15, and you can add three to um, three to seven. That's 10, and add five more. Okay. How about six plus seven? Six plus seven is 13, because <laughs> six plus four is 10, and plus three is 13. <laughs> How about seven plus eight? Seven plus eight would be fifteen. You, you take two out of the seven to add to the eight with, to make ten, and then you add the five you have from the seven to make fifteen. Nine plus six. Then that would be fifteen. Why? Um, because the nine would pop off one from the six and turn it into a five, and then the nine would turn into a ten, and then the five would pop the zero out and pop in its place. So don't you just love his language? I just love that kid. He's like in almost every video because he just had a cool way to think about stuff. But you could tell that was not taught to him. He has, he, that's not teacher language, right? We wouldn't be saying, you just pop this off and bring it in, right? He has made that up himself. He sees how those numbers work and I'm just gonna pop this off and bring it over here and that makes that, right? So he, these strategies, like I said, kids come up with. We can teach it, we can help them, we can help build these number relationships, but a lot of your students are gradually, are, are naturally doing this on their own, okay? So this last one, again, the first, the first clip is, this is the Fighting Fives, and I gave the kids things like six plus six, thinking, oh, they'll know that, that's a double. And this kid was doing something way different than just knowing it. And what's interesting is when I'm doing these videos is that if a kid just knows it, they tell me, they're like, well, that's one I just know. We've done that a lot in class, but they're not in my clips because they don't have this cool thinking stuff that they're sharing, right? So, and some of this stuff, it sounds like the strategy is like, are they really doing that in their head or are they just talking about it? These strategies become so quick that you don't know that they aren't just knowing it, right? Kids will use these strategies very quickly. The more they do it, the more flexible they get, okay? So here's our last one. Six plus six. Six plus six is 12. I I take five out of each group of six, add those together, I get 10. Then the leftover ones in each group of six, I add together, which would equal two. Then I add the two to the 10, which would equal 12. Okay. How about seven plus eight? Seven plus eight? 15. How'd you do that? Um, I take the three from the eight and the two from the um, seven and made that into a five and then I just added the, the other two fives and put them together and made 15. Okay, so what these kids have that our other students don't are these four things. These come from John Vandewell's work. So there's the name down at the bottom. I'll give the reference of the book at the end again. Okay. The first thing that kids need to have is a spatial relationship. That means a picture of the number, right? Now, if I told you to close your eyes and picture seven, most of us close our eyes and picture the actual number or numeral of seven. That is not seven. That is a symbol to represent seven. It is not seven. I once heard Marcy Cook talk. She talked about how that's like equating, if, if I said picture cat, most of you actually have a picture of a cat. You don't picture C-A-T. C-A-T is the symbol to represent cat. Seven is the symbol that represents seven. It is not seven. 
We don't spend enough time helping kids understand what seven is. What does it look like? And the problem is most of the time that we do that is we have individual manipulatives that you're counting out one by one by one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There's seven because I counted seven. And trying to picture seven things, your brain cannot do it if you just picture seven individual pieces. The only way you can picture seven is to have it grouped in some way. You can picture up to about four. After that, you need some kind of grouping. Our manipulatives that we use do not group things for kids. That's why 10 frames are so powerful because it puts things into a group of five and another five which makes our 10. Okay, that's what math racks do for kids. It gives kids a visual to attach to the number. That's also what number lines and number paths can do because you see where seven is in relation to the other numbers. You see the other numbers attached with it. Okay? One and two more or less is instantly knowing what is one more and two less. You see a lot of kiddos when it's seven plus two, seven, eight, nine. Right? They don't instantly know it. There's a specific standard in the Common Core State Standards that talks about, I believe it's first grade, relating addition to counting. Kids have been adding one since they've been two years old. If they've been counting, they have been adding one. If they've been counting backwards, they have been subtracting one, right? And kids need to relate that to it. If you ask a kid, what is seven plus one? I don't know. If you ask what comes next after seven, they'll tell you eight. It's the same thing of if you ask them what's one more than seven, they won't tell you. But if you ask what comes next, they can tell you. It's, so we just have to help them relate what they already know to the symbols that we're asking them to understand, okay? Um, the benchmarks of 5 and 10, we, kids need to know how a number relates to 10 instantaneously. Instantaneously. If I say 8, they should know that it takes 2 more to give it to 10. Because our system is based on a base 10 system. Right? It is important that kids know how to get to that benchmark of 10 instantly. It's also nice if kids know how that number relates to 5. Because as we've seen, two fives can help kids make a 10. So in early grades, like pre-K and K, you start with how does a number relate to five? You develop a fiveness of a number before you get to tenness of a number, right? There's a big push of helping kids understand tenness, but fiveness of a number, that's how a number relates to five, is just as important, okay? And actually should come first. The last part is part, part, whole. This is stuff that textbooks have been doing a pretty good job of, of one part of it, one piece of the part, part, whole. So part, part, whole is knowing that if I have seven, I can break it up in lots of different ways. I can break it up into a six and one, a five and two, and so on, right? So we spend a lot of time having kids do that. The hard part is they don't know when to use it. They don't understand why this is important to know. Besides just knowing that those are the facts that make seven, it's actually useful later, right? How many of you remember doing prime factorization in school? Do you know what you use it for? Maybe. That's what I like to equate doing part, part, whole problems with. You're making kids find all the parts that will make it up, but do they know why it's useful? Are they actually going to go use it? Because if I have 9 plus 7, I'm going to break that 7 up differently than if I had 8 plus 7. Right? And do they know when to break it up and for what reasons? That's the big part of part, part, whole is, okay, now I know the parts, but how do I actually use this stuff? Okay? So these four things are, are pieces that our kids who we, we see as they've they got that good math mind. It's because they have these things. They've had a lot of experience. They have people at home helping them out. They played games all the time growing up, right? They come from families who do like math stuff. Not necessarily worksheets, but they play games. They talk about numbers. They, they earn money doing chores at their house, and so they have to figure out adding stuff up. They just do it naturally. They've had a lot of exposure versus kids who come from families that don't have that exposure. Okay? So it, it, it takes a lot of ex experiences to build this stuff up. So like I said, his book has a lot more activities to, to address this. We're going to touch on a few because, oh man, I only have 17 minutes left. Okay, we're going to touch, touch on a few, but his book has a lot more ideas in there. Okay? All right, so let's talk about why these manipulatives matter again. Why I really am pushing the math rack and 10 frame stuff on you. Okay? So, Watch the screen, it's only going to appear for half a second and then it's going to disappear. And you need to tell me how many circles you see. Okay, everybody can see the screen. Can't want to look. Okay, it's going to come up and then it's going to disappear. Here it comes. 
Anybody know? Eight, you think? Eight or nine? Anybody want to bet me 100 bucks? No? Come on. All right, watch the screen again. Again, it's only going to come up for a half a second. Ready? Here it comes. Are you sure? Yes. Would you bet me 100 bucks? Yes. yes. What made the difference? Those groupings. If you don't group it, it forces kids to count one by one by one. That's what normal manipulatives do for kids. If I count out eight and then I count out seven, the only thing I have left to do is go back and count every single one of those. There's nothing in those manipulatives that helps me see a group. Okay? So putting those things into a 10 frame or using the math rack helps kids see the groups and pull the groups to use strategies instead of counting one by one by one. Okay, let's do a couple more. So watch the screen again. It's gonna show up and here it comes. You know, seven maybe. Okay, watch again. We'll see if it makes any difference this time. Here it comes and now. Are you sure? That was too fast, I didn't have that up there. If, if you've worked with the math rack some, what, what, what did you guys see? Somebody who saw, describe what you saw. All the red, bunch of red and two. Okay, so the only thing you need to know is what's the red? Five, right? And so the math rack, as you're working with kids, they have to develop that fiveness. They make sense of, that's five. Every time I push the red over, that's five, that's five. Okay. Just like when you're using a 10 frame, if you've got a 10 frame, what's always, how much is always on the top? Five. And the bottom row is always five. So if the top row is full, I don't have to count it. I just know that that is five and I can move on. Okay. So let's do another one with some 10 frames. You ready? Here it comes. Everybody watch the screen. Here we go. Maybe 10? Not sure. What, why was that not a good example? They were scattered everywhere. And so if you're using 10 frames, you have to put them in intentionally. Kids need to fill the top row first and then go to the bottom row. I've also seen people who you put one on the top, one on the bottom, one on the top, one on the bottom. That builds something different for kids. That builds the idea of doubles and odd and evens. If you want to build the ideas of 10 and 5, you fill the top row first and then go to the bottom row. Okay, so it just depends on what you're wanting to do with kiddos. Okay, so let's watch again and see if this makes any difference then. You ready? Here it comes. You got that one this time? All right, what did you see? Who can describe that? Full 10, one more, right? Structure matters. Structure matters. Thus, the manipulatives that we use need to have some structure to them. So if you have a bunch of individual things that you use the linking cubes, you use goldfish crackers, you use teddy bears, whatever it might be for counting purposes, create a 10 frame that's just a big placemat and have the kids put the counters right into it. They can count out seven individually, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they can count out the eight, but then when they go back to look at it, now they have a different picture to look at because I could look and see, oh, now I could see these groups of five, which if I just have individual things stuck out, I can't see those groups, okay? So we need to use those groupings to our advantage. A lot of stuff's out there about dot patterns. This is an example of a dot pattern that you should not do, okay? This dot pattern forces kids to have to count one by one by one. If they try to see groupings, they're actually gonna be off because a lot of times kids will say, oh, there's a five and a five and two extras but they're, du they're duplicating two of those, okay? So this kind of a, a format makes kids have to count. Instead, make them nice, right? Put some structure to them. Make them ones that kids can actually tell what's going on. The whole idea of doing dot pattern cards like this, flashing them up there like I've done, is do it in groups so kids don't have to count one by one by one. Help them see groups. There's a lot of research that talks about we need to get kids away from counting one by one by one to seeing a collection of things, seeing a group of stuff. Okay? And that's basically what this is all about. You need to help kids see groups and the manipulatives make the difference. Okay? So, some activities. Okay? Um, like I said, any of the stuff that we do here, we're gonna be talking about it using the math rack, but you can do the same thing with the 10 frames. Okay? So I'm gonna bring this up. 
One of the first activities I do, we spend a lot of time playing with this, learning how it works, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not going to tell you quite yet how to use it. We'll, we'll talk about that after we do this activity. Okay, first thing I like to have kids do is just show me on one row, and I'm not, I'm not going to put this up because I don't want you to know how to use it quite yet. I want you to try to figure out how would you do it. Show me six, but only on one row. Show me six on one row. Show me six. And look at somebody's next to you and share with the people around you. Okay, show me six. So the key to the math rack is you have to be consistent with how you are showing numbers on here so that the focus is not on the colors, but the focus is on the math. Okay? So some of you might be showing six like this with the white and one red. And some of you might be showing it with all the reds and one white. We don't want kids focusing on, well, you showed white and I showed red, so ours are different. Okay? You have to be consistent. The, the, the way that it is, has been brought over, and I don't know if it, there's a reason. My reason is that red is more vibrant, so I can close my eyes and picture it a whole lot clearer. Okay? So the correct way, there's one rule to using the math rack. You always start with the beads on your right side. Beads always start on your right, and we put white on right. White on right. White on your right. Okay? Then you have to teach the kids which one's their right hand. <laughs> right? Um, we, have, we have a lot of teachers that will put stickers on there so that they know which, you know, the beads always go over to the sticker. When white is on the right, then as I'm pushing, the reason you start at the right and you push over is because then I'm pay our, our mind naturally looks over here at the left, so I'm paying attention to the piece that got pushed, not the beads that are out of play. So I push one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And that's the way kiddos will start. They will start counting each bead individually. And that's fine, that's where they're at. They, they can count one by one by one. The cool part about this tool though is, did you guys count one by one by one? No, I can quickly start saying, hmm, who can show me it in the least number of pushes, right? That took me six pushes to do that. Can anybody do it faster than that, right? And so we get a kid who will say, well, I can do all five at once and then one more. I'm great, that's two pushes. And the goal is to get them to be able to do it in one push. Get it in one push. And we want them basically to be able to visualize it and then be able to push it over. Show me. And the show me activity, everybody should look exactly the same. Because you're showing it all on one row and the rule, you always start over here so everybody should look the same. Then you get to focus on the math. Hmm, when we push the six over, how many white beads did we have over here? Right? That builds a relationship up to five. How many were left over? How many did, did we not push over? Builds a relationship to 10. Okay, so you get to, the, just the structure of it helps you build some of that number sense for kiddos that they wouldn't get if you just count out six things. Okay, um, the other one I like to do is, as kids get more, a little bit more fluent with this, I cover this on the whiteboard with a piece of paper or a sheet or something, and I'll push beads over with this being covered, and then I'll flash it for a second or two, and then I put it back over, and then they have to try to figure out how much I have there, right? So we flash it. Sometimes I'll have them, uh, they can just say the number. Sometimes I'll have them show me with their fingers, so then they get the finger patterns going. Sometimes I'll have a 10 frame in front of them, and they have to show me with a 10 frame how much was shown on the math rack, okay? So it's just, just having them um, be able to quickly see it without having to count one by one by one. That's where we want to get them to, go faster, okay? All right. So another one that I like to use, and, and I didn't bring all the, the number pass stuff, is a race to 20. But it's, you get number any wooden cubes like at any craft store. And because dice, dice, you only focus on, if you're playing like a board game with dice, you get plus one through plus six. Well, sometimes I just want to focus on what's plus zero, plus one, and plus two. So you create your own dice that just have zero, one, and two, plus zero, one, and two. And they roll that, and that's how many beads they get to push over. So if they roll a two, they get to push two over. If they roll a one, they push one over. If they roll zero, what happens? 
right? So they get to focus on those things. And it's a race to who can fill their, their t math rack or who can fill their 210 frames. And then we also do it like where they'll run up a number path. So they'll have a little um, like car or teddy bear and they hop up the number path as they, they do that, okay? All right. This next one is show me, but this time I want you to show me six, like we did last time, but you get to use two rows. Show me six using two rows. Okay, quickly look at somebody next to you. Do you have the same thing they do? I have never done a workshop where everybody had the same thing when I said that. A common one that I see, though, is three and three, right? Because I could split it in half. I could also have four and two. And it helps kids get that whole idea of give and take. That if I want to have five here, I need to take one away from here, right? And how that still balances out to still be six, OK? So there's different ways that you can show all of that. Um, one of the other ways is to cover. So if I push this many over, I cover this side. And then they get to see this, but they have to tell me what this is over here, right? And that builds that part, part, whole, but what's the missing part? Because they know that that's going to be 10. So they have to tell me this piece over here. So sometimes we're paying attention to what we push over. Sometimes we're paying attention to what we did not push over, OK? So these are just a few examples. I tell you, there are, I mean, there's tons more that we could do. But what I wanted to get to is how do we do addition? This was developed in the Netherlands to help kids with their basic math facts. That's why it only goes to 20. It's not a full abacus. It doesn't go to 100. And these beads never become anything but one. In an abacus, they're ones, but then you turn it sideways, and now they're 10 and 1,000 and whatever, right? These are worth one. That's it. Okay? And it only goes to 20 because our addition facts only go to 20. Okay? Now, I'm not going to tell you how to put this up there. I just want you to think about how would you use this tool to show me 8 plus 7, right? How would you show 8 plus 7 on your tool? Okay, there's two main ways. For sake of time, we're not going to go too, too deeply into this, okay? One way is to show the eight, whoops, helps if I get the eight correctly, eight on top, seven on the bottom, top and bottom. When I do that, a lot of kids, this is why that finding fives becomes really popular, right? They see two fives that make a 10, and then they have their extra over here, okay? Some kids don't like putting anything on the bottom until they fill the top, right? So, They'll say, well, I have the eight. I need two more here. So then how much more do I need to push on the bottom? 10. I push those over, right? Five more there. Gets us there. So that's that make a 10 strategy. Other kids, if it's lined up like this, a lot of times they'll see the fives, but you can still even see the doubles, right? I have doubles. They match up seven and seven. I like things to be equal. And then I have one more, or I'm missing one to be able to make it eight plus eight. So all of those strategies that we talked about can easily be modeled on the math rack or the 10 frame for kiddos, okay? The other piece I'm gonna show you really quickly is on a number path, how that gets shown, okay? It'll come up for me or not. A few seconds seems like minutes when you're up here. OK, so let's say I'm doing the 8 plus 7. I have the 8, so I'd have the kids circle the 8. And then that kid says, well, I want to move the other 2 over. So I have 8 plus the 2. And then what was the last thing they had to push over? 5 more gives me 15. Right. So whatever they did on their math rack, I have them circle the same things on their number path to show exactly what they did on there, okay? So for the sake of time, I'm gonna quickly go through. This is known as the concrete to representational to abstract. You guys heard that before? We want kids to do the concrete, the physical thing with the math rack, but then we need to have them do a representation, a drawing, that's the number path, and then move to the number sentence that attaches with it, okay? Last thing, why does this matter? Okay, this is a quick little string. 
Okay. If I do 9 plus 7, what's a quick strategy? 10 plus 6, make it a 10, right? Can I do the same thing here? It would become 10 plus 5. This one becomes 10 plus 7. What would this one become then? 20 plus 6, right? What would this one be then? Ah, 40 plus 6. What about this one then? 60 plus 16, right? These strategies are not just for their facts. If they learn these strategies and how numbers work, it helps with all of addition, no matter what, okay? Here's another one. What would this become? 300 plus 16, what's this one gonna be? 174, last one. You guys freaking out, all right? What's it become? 4 plus 0.16. Does that seem too difficult? No. If kids have strategies, it helps them forever. Memorization does not help them forever. Okay? Strategies work forever. Okay? Here's the resources. MathRec.com is where the, these tools come from. I'm, my website's mathematically minded. I also do fact fluency. Teaching Student Center in Mathematics is the one that should become your Bible. If you've never heard of it, get on Amazon and buy it now. I have a book on the math rack. There's also a book by Melissa Conklin that is just on 10 frames, how you use them, great activities for that. Okay. I'll also bring up my contact info here in a moment. So I just want to thank you, number one, for coming to my session and for coming to San Diego to learn more. Thank you.